Hey guys, this is Pastor AJ here, and I just want to welcome you to our Friday experience here at Open Door Church. Thank you so much for tuning in. And before we continue, please make sure to like this and share this all over your social media platforms. Be the social media missionary you were called to be. And let me tell you, you're tuning in on an incredible day. Pastor Troy has an incredible word for you guys. It's going to be so awesome. It is such a timely word. And also, wherever you're at, whether you're in your house, in your car, in your bed, don't be ashamed. Just close your eyes, lift up your hands, and just worship with us. It's going to be awesome. Wait, I'm going to have to ask. I love to ask it twice. Open Door Church, how's everybody doing this morning? Who's excited to be in the house of God today, man? We are expecting great things. We're expecting miracles to happen in the house of God. And if you want to join us, can somebody just put your hands together and give God a mighty shout of praise in this place? Come on, just give a mighty shout. Give a mighty shout. Come on, somebody praise God in this house. Declare his glory. song it goes like this sing with me our praise becomes your house your place our praise becomes your house Come on. your place sing it out our praise becomes your house your place our praise becomes your house, your place. That's it, let's go. Our praise becomes your house, your place. Pop it out. Our praise yeah. becomes your house, your place. Oh. Our praise becomes your house, your place, oh God. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Oh, we sing a song. We sing a song and you come in. Make a dance and you come in. Shout your name and you come in. Give you praise and you come in. Sing a song and you come in. Make a dance and you come in. Shout your name and you come in. Oh, you inhabit the praises of your 
God, we declare your glory, Lord. Can you high-five your neighbor? Just say, it's going to be a good day in the house of God. Come on, high-five your neighbor. We're going to keep declaring his glory. His never-ending love. spoke a word you were singing over me yes you were God you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me. Come on, let's all say this. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till i found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. You're always there every step of the way, Lord, calling our name. I will give you thanks every day for the rest of my life, God. I was your foe, still you love fought for me. <laughs> yes, you did. Cause you have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind.
light up mountain you won't climb up come on somebody say that with us there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down that's right there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down nothing in this world that's going to stop that's going to stop us from worshiping your name Lord and there's nothing that's going to stop you from taking care of your sons and your daughters Lord so we will forever forever God give you our best praise our best worship <laughs> guys can you just lift up your hands right there where you're at King Jesus, in your mighty name we pray and declare that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, God. And we're declaring this in your mighty name. And that no weapon that comes against us has the power, Lord, because you are the God Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And you have the last word. There is no addiction that you can break. There is no depression that you can take away. There's no anxiety that won't go away right now as we declare your mighty name, King Jesus. And we lift it up with everything we have. And we're going to shout it from the rooftops that you reign the heavens and the earth. And there's nothing that's going to stop us from saying, Jesus, Jesus. God, we make room for you, God. Is there anybody here that's willing to surrender everything you have today? This is your moment. Just let go. Just let go and receive the presence of God in your life. surrender this is my surrender here is 
tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better Shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better Come on, let's say that one more time Shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better cry out to you. We cry out to you for the way out. God, the way out of oppression, the way out of those old traditions that just need to move aside, Lord. We're ready to take the next step. We're ready to advance into our promised land. And we believe that you are our light and our salvation, Jesus. Holy Spirit, will you do a work right now change our hearts, make room for yourself to make a home in our hearts. We love you so much. This is all for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you guys. You're amazing. You're amazing. We love you so much. Thank you for worshiping with us. He's making room. He's doing a work in you right now. Count on him for that. We love you so much. Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, blessed and peace on you. How y'all are? You guys doing well? Good to see you, sweetie. Yeah, God bless you. It's so funny. I said, good to see you, sweetie. And every man in this part over here raise their hands. Uh, good to see you too, man. Good to see you guys. Hey, man, God bless y'all, man. Blessing and peace on you. Just saw some really cool videos from our 30th anniversary party that we had last Sunday night at the Open Door Food Bank. Dadgummit, it was a blast. Man, it was good. We had so much fun. That's like some real Texas barbecue and it was so good. Big part of it was provided by Holy Smoke and that's real. Holy Smoke's one of our barbecue companies that's in, that's in our house here and they did a great job. It was good barbecue, wasn't it guys? It was really good. And then of course we had all kinds of fun stuff. One of my favorite things that happened uh, that, that we did was the games that we played. That was a hoot. And I wanna just tell you right now, we had a pepper eating contest that I was like, okay, now it's getting dangerous because once we got past 10 peppers and got into this, and guys, dude, there was jalapenos, habaneros, anaheims, cayenne peppers, and tree peppers. And Pauline Wick won it by eating 18 peppers, <laughs> including eight habaneros. So I don't know, during praise and worship, did y'all see those tongues of fire? Yeah, that was gastro. It was not supernatural. I was like, oh my God, I'll never mess with that woman. 18, just like, yep, no problem, no problem, no problem. Good, googly moogly. And then of course, 
Uh, AJ absolutely failed in his attempt to ride the bull, which was amazing. <laughs> Our children's church pastor, Kevin, he won the hot dog eating contest and in three minutes ate him seven hot dogs in three minutes. Yeah, we have overachievers here at Open Door Church. We're, we're next level. We really and truly are. Man, I want to welcome you guys here, and I'm so grateful that you guys came to church today. And how many of y'all, how many of y'all can say, I ain't scared? How many of y'all can say that? Way to go, man. Man, I'm proud of y'all. I bless you guys. What incredibly, what a minute, 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 I need somebody to interpret that. Troy Brewer is blessed of God. I'm sorry. What an incredibly eventful week we had this week. It was so good, y'all. It was so good. We saw some amazing things happen. I'm talking about next level things happen here this week. Uh, we can celebrate some really cool things. One of the things that we can celebrate, you know, we, just, we just got through celebrating 30 years at the Open Door Food Bank, 30 years. And... We're doing such a tremendous work, and there's so many people. You know, I get credit for all of that, which is not fair at all, because all, mostly all I do is go around and hug people. That's pretty much all I do. I'm pretty much worthless, but my teams are absolutely incredible. However, I get a lot of blame I don't deserve to, so I will take the credit. I just will. With that said, man, our teams have been working so hard, and guys have been doing incredible things. And one of the cool things, that um, I told y'all about this last week is that last week at the Open Door Food Bank, I ran into a lady that she had stage four colon cancer. Um, she's a single mama. She has a daughter. She has two grandchildren. She lives in a little bitty tiny house. Her, she didn't have a car. Her car had blown up. She's so sick and um, just, you know, waits in line at our Open Door Food Bank and I got to talking to her and I told you guys about her. And so everybody responded in such a cool way. So on Monday, we invited her in. And I wanna show you, I wanna show you a little bit of that video. This is a video of her. We were all in my office and, and we're talking to her and we're just blessing her. We're hearing her story and it was really cool. That's Leanna in that really cool green hat back there in the back. Man, Leanna looks so cool in a hat, man. I love it when Leanna wears a hat. Anyway, man, we were talking to her, and what I'm doing right there is I'm preparing to, do you guys see there, there's a check right there? We gave her a check for $5,900. And it totally blew her mind. That's not only that, guys, but we're gonna be working hard, man, to fix up her house. She doesn't have, a, she doesn't have air conditioning, we're doing that. She doesn't have appliances, she, her appliances don't work, and so we're gonna get her a new refrigerator, and we're also gonna get her a, a, a new stove, and we're gonna do that. But then on top of that, guys, we were able, there were some people here that stepped up and because her car don't work, we, we just went ahead and got her a new car. And guys, I wanna show you what the car looks like. Look at that, isn't that cool? So, look, I, I don't know her. I, I know her better now uh, this week, but I didn't know her before Saturday. And guys, this is who we can be as a church. And this is what we can do. Guys, we're doing it literally every single day. We're doing it every day. And it's just so much fun. In a day where the world says, no, 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 we're saying, go, 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 amen. We're saying, we're not gonna sit at home all balled up, freaked out, watching the news 24 hours a day and listen to that demonic narrative that's in the world that says that you have to be hopeless and you have to be shut down and you're not allowed to be the church. Rain on you, we're gonna be the church, amen. We defy anybody that tells us we cannot be the church. Defy it. We have the spirit of the living God and we have 2,000 years of history to back us up and we have the promise of the coming king, amen. And for us, man, being the church is being the hands and feet of King Jesus. And I wanna show you this video. We, were, we prayed for her, we loved on her, we blessed her, we encouraged her. She bawled and she squalled. She couldn't believe that there's people like us. Like what? Yeah, man. Yeah, this is what it looks like when Jesus shows up, right on? This is what it looks like. And guys, I'll tell you, it was, it was a hootin' nanny. It was really good. It was, it was crazy cool. Um, I can tell you that um, in response to Hurricane Laura, I, was, I mean, since we didn't have anything else to do, we went ahead and we sent a whole truckload of food 
down to a, a food and water and Gatorade and all kinds of stuff. We hooked up with a team of people, took it down there, and today on this day, we are reaching out to families who have had their homes devastated, people who don't have anything, and you know what? We're making sure that they're fed, we're making sure that they're taken care of, we're hearing their stories and we're seeing how we can help. Is that all right, guys? Amen? Yep. A few weeks ago, I told you the story about a little girl that we had discovered that was 18 years old that was in Arkansas, and uh, she, we found out through this amazing lady that um, reaches out and does this amazing thing where she does homeless outreach, and while she's doing that, she looks for girls that are being trafficked, and there's just so many of them. And uh, she, she found a girl that was 18 years old that had been uh, in a foster care system her entire life. Uh, when she turned 18, she got booted out on the, uh, out on the street. Little bitty tiny thing. Um, I don't remember how tall she is, but I don't even think she's five foot tall. Do anybody remember how tall she is? She's just a hobbit, man. She's a little bitty thing. And uh, didn't even weigh 100 pounds, weighed 80 something pounds. 18 years old. Uh, looks like she's probably 13 or 14 years old. And she had already, she was already being owned by, by somebody. Already, already having her broken body, mess, her broken and messed up body sold. And, and our friend rescued her and got connected with us. And I wanna tell you, she didn't know us. She had heard about us because of the TV show. And after she called 64 churches who wouldn't help, she called us. Now I want you just to think about how unavailable most of the body of Jesus is and tell you this, we need to repent of that. Repent. Well, I'm sorry it doesn't have anything to do with my TV show. I'm sorry it doesn't have anything to do with how many clicks I get and how much money is coming in. We don't have time for that. We don't have staff for that. So she ended up calling and calling 64. And then she got a hold of us. We said, yeah, man, we'll help you. Let's go. I mean, it's just what we do. And so we did. And I want to just tell you this, that that girl has not only been rescued, that girl has not only been saved, but that girl is in a program now that has given her a career and given her a life that she could not imagine. She's, com she's completely, it's amazing. Well, the lady that actually did that, that found her, uh, we got together and we talked with her and we were just so impressed. I mean, we were, that, we were her for a very long time. We were out there by ourselves doing our thing. Nobody in the world would help us. And we see her out there by herself doing her thing. She and her husband are out there just, just hammering it for Jesus. She's gonna be here today during the second service and we're giving her an outreach truck. We bought her an outreach truck and we're giving it to her. I wanna show you that outreach truck, check it out. Everybody go, ooh. Now let me show you the next one, ah. Everybody say, wow, yeah, that's it. So guys, we're actually giving that to her today. Hey, is that okay, guys, if we help other people like that? When you hope, man, I know that in all the ministries that I support outside of Open Door Church, I just go, man, I really hope that they're available to be the hands and feet of King Jesus and support them and believe them for that and trust them with that. Well, so it is here with us. I know that y'all are trusting us with this. So this is what we do. We say yes to everything until we have to say no. And that's how we've done it for, for 30 years. We just have a yes in our spirit. We have a yes in our heart and it's real. Praise the name of King Jesus. He's just so good. So yesterday, we did a food outreach in Cleburne, Texas at the Railroaders. And friends, we actually fed 1,350 people and gave away 100,000 pounds of food in Cleburne, Texas yesterday. Now I'm gonna stop making announcements of all that we've been doing, but that's not all that we've been doing. We've been busy this week. We've been really busy. It cracks me up to hear a pastor say, man, the church has just burned me out. I'm like, dude, the church is the easiest thing we do around here. Right on. And I, and I know how mean and I know how terrible a church can be. And I, and I tell you this, like, yeah, we do too. I, here's what I learned. What I, what I thought was such a big deal from the pew side, I found out that it's worse on the pulpit side. And I'm like, okay, I, I understand why people do such crazy things and all that. But listen, we're determined. 
We're bound and determined. Look, we're not gonna do big church if we're not gonna do big ministry. We're just not going to. And we're also not going to do church if we can't be happy and full of the Holy Spirit in doing that, right on? So I wanna ask you guys to stand up if you would. Tell you what a big deal it is. Can you think about that? 1,300 people just in a day of just the body of Jesus stepping up and saying, not on our watch, we don't mind working hard. We know that it takes hard work to be a blessing. Can I say that to you? It takes hard work to be a blessing. And if you're gonna be a blessing, you're gonna have to work hard to be a blessing. Because all you gotta do to be a curse is nothing. Just sit there. All you have to do is have no empathy, have no passion, to not accept the call, to not feel the hurt of other people, to not feel the fire of God. All you gotta do to be a curse is nothing. But man, if you're gonna be a blessing, man, it takes hard work, it takes a lot of dedication, it takes a lot of commitment. And I'm saying that to you to say this, you're not stupid for doing that. I thank God for all that you do that none of the rest of us have a clue about. How hard you work, the things that you do, the difference that you're making, your selflessness, how that you fight battles and you bear burdens that nobody else knows about, thank you for that. I, I recognize that we do not know. But I'm telling you this, Jesus knows. And man, if you're gonna believe in God, you gotta believe that God sees your life. You gotta believe that. I mean, if you're gonna believe that Jesus is real and that he is resurrected and he's sitting on a throne right now and he's coming back, you have to believe. Dude, he's looking at my life, he's looking. He actually sees me and once you get it, that God sees you, it's just stupid how motivated you can be to do things that nobody else sees. And it's wonderful. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter nine, it says, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I love that scripture. This is, this is what I call banking grace. You know, yesterday I was in Houston. And I was down there speaking at, at, at an event in downtown Houston. And, and I was connected to, there's some good friends of mine that I didn't do one thing to start this relationship with them. <laughs> they have reached out to me, they connected with me, we went to their house and we ate after the event. They're just such a beautiful couple and they're extraordinary human beings. And I was with Greg, my media guy, and he said, you know, it's just amazing the relationships that God gives you. I'm like, it really is, isn't it? It's ridiculous. And I want you to think about this. How many relationships have we built as a church with girls like the trafficked girl in Arkansas that you reach out to them, you love them, you help them, you bless them, you hear their stories, you get involved, and nobody else, 64 other ministries that represents tens if not hundreds of thousands of Christians. Like, nope, I'm not gonna get involved in that, in that relationship. How many of those can we say that we've been a part of? Okay, well, I'm gonna just tell you this. If you wanna know why I have so much favor, where next level people just want to be connected to me and we can do extraordinary things, is because I've banked a lot of grace in the past 30 years. I have sown into relationships that were not beneficial for me at all. I've sown and sown and sown into that. And then it causes me to have relationships that are beneficial. In whatever areas of your life that you're selflessly serving the Lord, you can expect God Almighty to do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask or think as Ephesians 3, 3.20 says. So I know that you're selfless in your giving. I know that you're faithful in your giving, but I wanna make sure, man, that your heart is lined up with the Lord in this because I wanna tell you this, you have sown, you have sown and sown and sown and I pray that you reap and reap and reap. Are y'all ready? Father God, sir, bless our finances, Lord God. Do great and mighty things, God. Let there be new income streams, Father God. I pray, Father God, sir, for next level financial miracles for every single person, God, that is partnering with us, that is just believing, God, that this is how, God, we serve you, Lord. And I pray, Lord God Almighty, sir, that you would do greater and better. I pray, Lord God Almighty, sir, that there would be the kind of testimonies in our church that once, once we got connected with them, my God, look at what the Lord did within, within our lives. I pray, God, that you would do that. 
God, let it be, and I thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Everybody here, stay together. Okay, guys, if y'all have an offering to give, you can bring it up front. If you want to get my cards, there are people that are holding up cards. And for all my friends that are watching live online all over the world, hi, y'all. I'm going to turn this over to Miss Tabitha. Thank you all again for tuning in here at Open Door Church in Burleson, Texas. We are so excited that you stopped by. Now, wasn't that so amazing to hear all of the great things that we're able to accomplish because of you, because of all of your faithful giving? I'm telling you what, we cannot be the body of Christ that we are called to be if we do not have a, if we're not together as the body, if we're not healthy if any one of us is sick, that we don't reach out to them and we heal them and we take care of them and we be the body of Christ, we be connected. And, you know, it's so funny because I think of... Um I think of the Power Rangers. I don't know if any of y'all watched the Power Rangers as a kid, but you know, there's like five or six of them and separated, they're all small, but then they can get in their big like Megatron or whatever it was, and they can be this huge giant to fight the enemy and finally defeat it. And that is what it is. We are all connected to build this huge giant to battle the enemy and say not on our watch. So if you have an offering to give, now is the perfect time. And you can do that by texting open door, or I'm sorry, it's not open door anymore. It's O-D-C-E-X-P. So you'll text O-D-C-E-X-P to 77977. Or you can go online to opendoorexperience.com. There's a giving button there and it'll prompt you through giving. You can also send in a check or a money order at PO Box 3775, Burleson, Texas, 76097. Of course, if you need help with any ways to give, if you want to give right there online, if you want to partner on a monthly basis, or if you need a prayer, call 877-413-0888. All right, you guys, thank you so much for giving. Share this message if you have not already, and I will see you guys at the end. Bye, you guys. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name is power, because your name is power. Hey, thanks for partnering with us with your giving. Now check out what's coming up here at Open Door. Here at Open Door, there's a place for everyone. Are you looking to serve, to get connected? Then I dare you to get plugged into one of our ministries. For more information, you can email us at info at opendoorexperience.com. Hey, if you haven't done so yet, go to your app store and download the Open Door Experience app and stay connected with us. It's a platform to also give and you can check out all of the ministries that we have. Community groups are how we do ministry here at Open Door. Are you looking to build life-giving relationships or just meet new people? Here in the sanctuary, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., we hold community groups. We would love to see your face. For more information, visit us at community at opendoorexperience.com. Again, 7 p.m., Wednesday nights here in the sanctuary. So that is what we have going on at Open Door Church. Now help me welcome my friend, Pastor Troy Brewer, to the stage. Okay. I'm happy, 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 happy man to be here today. All right, man, you guys ready to jump off into this? So I'm probably going to preach a little bit different in all three services today. I'm, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got a lot of things to go over today. So are y'all going to be with me, Ryan? You going to be with me? Is everybody in a good mood? Do you know the person next to you? Have you just said hi? Can you just say hi to them? Just say, hey, man, how you doing? Hey, if it's... If it's your spouse, or especially if you're thinking about getting married, say, hey, do I know you? <laughs> yep. Right on. Okay. Well, I think I'm about ready, except for just one say, hey, man, I know that there's people that come in from all over the place. Anybody here from out of town today, or where are y'all from? Where are you from, Ladybug? 
Gainesville, Texas is in the house. Dude, welcome. I'm so glad that you made it here. Thank you so much for coming. Anybody else? From Dallas, man, thanks for driving all the way from Dallas. I know there's several people here from Dallas today, man. I know that there are. Where y'all from back over there? From, from, from Colorado. Man, thanks for coming, guys. God bless y'all, man. It's good to see y'all today. Welcome. Anybody else? Where y'all from? San Diego, California. Man, I bless you. Anybody else here today? Anybody here from Itasca, Texas? Let me see you. Right on, Itasca's here. What about Blum? We got any Blumites in here? There's a Blumite right over there. Right on. We got any Granberry folks in here today? Woo, Granberry. Right on, man. Good to see you. We got a guy here from Glen Rose. Right on. Okay, well, let's get ready to do this. Here we go, here we go. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your word today. I pray, God, that you make it so real. And God, I pray, God, that you'd speak to us today, Lord, and convict us and encourage us and bless us, Lord God. Realign us, straighten us up, accelerate us, Lord. And God, I thank you so much. I praise you and I thank you, God. In Jesus' name, everybody here say together. Church, will you join me in welcoming the whole planet Earth to Big Time Burleson, Texas? Y'all, this is the Open Door Experience. Boom! <laughs> Welcome, my friends. Blessing and peace on you, man, in Jesus' name. Guys, I'm so glad that you made it here today. Thank you. Everybody's watching us in 200 nations all over the world, man. I bless you guys. Call you guys blessed. So this has been a, a very eventful week as I was telling you guys a little bit earlier and just telling you, man, the Lord has just given us a front row seat to his goodness on so many different levels. I'm just so grateful for it. And I also want to just tell you that uh, yesterday I was in Houston and I spoke at uh, the Faith and Freedom Rally in Houston yesterday. And, you know, there was a lot of, there wasn't a single speaker there that wasn't amazing. I was like, wow, every single one of them was like, wow, every one of them. And then, you know, I'm, I'm going to get up there and I'm going to, I'm going to finish, right? As a last speaker. And I'm like, wait, I got to follow all these guys. I'm just, you know, man, our role in this current political environment and in the tremendous transition that we've been through this year needs to be defined as the body of King Jesus. And we need to know what our lanes are because you don't want to get involved in every single fight that there is. You just don't. There's, there's a battlefield that you have grace for. And there's a bunch of battlefields that you do not have grace for. And you need to know what your calling is and you need to know who you are in King Jesus. Y'all know that Brother David was the greatest warrior probably that the world has ever seen. Like, well, what about Samson? No, he way outdid Samson. He sure did. Maybe not as far as physical strength and agility went, but as far as the difference he made and the thing that he did. You know, after Samson died, there was still 400 years of additional slavery that the Philistines put the Jewish people under. But uh, not after David. He's like, you're done. Anything that he perceived was a threat in his land, he took care of in his lifetime. After David, you don't find any more lions because he killed them all. After David, you don't find any more giants because he killed them all. After David, they don't have to worry about Philistines anymore. David did that for Israel. I thank God for warriors. Aren't you just glad for warriors who say, not on my watch. You know what? I know what my role is. I know what my duty is. I know what I've got to give because, see, I'm going to pass this down to a, to, a, to a son named Solomon. And he's got to be a man of peace, which is what his name means. Is one of, the understand, one of the understandings of his name. He's going to build the temple of God. And besides that, he's a mama's boy. <laughs> and I got to take care of it while I'm here because Solomon ain't going to do it. I promise you that. He has to have peace handed off to him to be able to build. He's not a warrior like I am, David would say. But you know, there was a day that the Bible says that David almost got killed by a giant. And, and you know, David had been in so much traumatic battle, but he actually had some kind of form of PSTD out of it. He had some kind of, uh, he had some kind of form, it, it, something didn't go right in this battle. And there was a giant and he was actually in, a, he was seconds away from being killed by a giant and one of his mighty warriors came and rescued him. And afterwards, they all got together and they said, dude, if you die, this whole thing's over. And you cannot die. 
And we think it's a good idea now that you're getting up in age to not be on the front lines anymore. And you need to stay back and do the king thing. Let us go to war. And he said, yeah, I think that's probably right. Now, mind you, he had never been old before, and he was just now getting old, like a bunch of us, right? Like, I ain't never been old before. Why does this hurt? Ah, because I'm old now, right? And like, what the heck? What is that? Oh, I forgot. I'm old. Well, David was just experiencing that for the very first time, and he just kind of thought, imagine he thought about it, and he thought about, he actually thought he was going to die. Everybody else thought that he was going to die. In a moment, they forgot all the promises of God. They forgot the anointing that was on his life because they were in a traumatic situation that was just terrible, and sometimes in the midst of our, in the midst of our humanity, that's exactly what happens, and it happened to him. So he stays back, and the Bible says at the time that kings should go to war, David was in his palace. And he walks out in the middle of the night, can't sleep. He's missing the smell of the battlefield. He's missing hanging out with his boys. He's missing the anticipation of the battle yet to come. And he's like, oh, there's nothing really to do. So he's about to get in a lot of trouble because it's one o'clock in the morning and he's on the internet. (laughs) And he walks out on the back porch And he looks and he sees this woman taking a bath and he keeps looking and he keeps looking and he keeps looking. And then from that moment forward, David never lived that he did not have hell in his life. He had hell in his family and he had hell in his life, literally on his deathbed, he was ordering the death of other people who were at war with him. Instead of being in a peaceful situation and instead of people singing songs and telling them how proud they were of him, they're like, dude, you're not done yet. You still gotta fight this battle. Dude, you're not done yet. You still... From that moment forward, the sword never left his house, the Bible says. And like, why? Because he wasn't on the field that he had grace for and he ended up on a battlefield he had no grace for. When you refuse to fight the battles that Jesus has called you to fight, if you say, no, I'm not gonna fight that, I promise you, you will end up on a battlefield that you do not have the ability to fight. And this is why we as the body of King Jesus, we as the church of Jesus Christ, no matter what denomination we are, no matter what background we have, if we're charismatic, if we're not charismatic, if we're pre-trib or if we're post-trib or if how we baptize or any of those things that we think matters so much, no matter where we come from, no matter how we express our worship towards Jesus, we have to know what our battle is. And there's a reason why most Christians have no business having a Twitter feed because they do not know how to not respond to every single thing that shows up there. Oh, I'll tell you this, I'll tell you that, I'll tell you this, I'll tell you that, I'll tell you this, I'll tell you that. And then what happens is you think you're being smart, but you just look stupid. And you don't have a grace for that. Now you might have a grace for that. And that might be, you might be called into the media mountain and that's part of what you do. And I thank God for that. But if that's not what you do, number one, you don't have to read it. You don't have to listen to it and you do not have to respond to it. You've got other battles that you need to be reading and responding to. Many other battles. And man, you need to know your calling. You need to know your role. You need to know who you are. You need to know what God has called you to do. And then, man, you need to take care of your territory in the promised land. All this week, I've been talking about the role and the responsibility of the body of King Jesus. And I've been thinking a whole lot about that because we're about to have our 25th anniversary as a church. And it's a big deal, man, to have a 25th anniversary, right? It's a big deal. Man, that you, not only that you lasted for 25 years, but that you actually succeeded because you were faithful in some things. Now, when I get up and whenever I start talking about that, one of the things I'm gonna be accused of is, you know, being arrogant or prideful and tooting my own horn. That's not what this is. This is me declaring that God has been much more faithful than we have. And, and, and that God has been much more good than we have been good. And he's been so awesome to us. He's been so awesome to us. And I'm not gonna let that slip. I'm not gonna act like that's not a big deal. 
I've told you guys from the very beginning that I didn't, I, I didn't even want to do the church part of this. I just wanted to do the outreach. I didn't want to do the church part. And, and then when we did the church part, I didn't want to be the preacher. I just wanted to lead worship. That was all I wanted to do. And I kept thinking, you know, that God was going to send somebody smart and we would turn the church over to them. But I didn't know that smart people do not sign up for church leadership. <laughs> I've learned. Because all of us knuckleheads that are running this place, we're, in, we're all in so far over our head. And guys, I don't mean to demean my team because we have an amazing team of people. I'm talking about, it's, it's, they're, they're actually, they're, they truly are a dream team. But none of us, none of us can stand up here and tell you we know what we're doing. We just know who God is in the midst of what we're doing. And, and we've been convinced of that for a very, very, very long time. We've been convinced of that. And so I, I, I didn't go into this going, I've got this. Everybody's like, Troy, you're such a great visionary. Man, dude, teach me to be a visionary like you. And I'm like, oh no, these people think I'm a visionary. <laughs> and, and it's a lot like, you know, like the great vision you must have had for Open Door Church. Guys, I am just telling you, everything that you see is because of the goodness of God. I did not envision this at all. What I envisioned was just having a church for all of our outreach recipients because they weren't welcome in other churches. That was it. We did it absolutely out of necessity because every time we sent our outreach recipients to other churches, they weren't treated right and they didn't fit in. And we thought, man, we'll just make a place for those people. Now I have a church of thousands of people who reach out to outreach recipients. And it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And I love yoga. I love y'all so much, but, but I, I, I appreciate you guys having confidence in me as a leader. I appreciate you guys having confidence in me as a pastor, but I want to tell you, I've never had confidence in me as a leader or as a pastor. I've just had a yes in my spirit. I'm a lot more confident now than I've ever been, but now as we're branching off into a whole bunch of things, which I'm not going to announce yet, but guys, we're about to do some stuff that I'm just like, <laughs> I'm like, who is an idiot running this show? Why can't we just be Baptists like everybody else? This is Texas. You know, and I'm not cussing the Baptists. We're all, we're all come from Baptist backgrounds. We all do. I'm not cussing them at all. I'm just saying, I get it. I'm like, why, why do we got to constantly be doing new stuff that is impossible to do? I love y'all's answers, but I, I think it might be because we have a whole lot of craziness and very little self-control. Maybe that's what it is. And I'm just like, dad, gum it. You know, my team, praise God that my team does not get mad at me every time I come in and close the door and say, okay, I got to tell y'all something because they all get quiet and they all start busting out their pins and they get ready because I know, they know I'm about to give them an impossible task. But my team actually loves that. They, they love that and they already have a huge job. All of us have this tremendous job to do and all of these things we don't see as interference. We see as grace that's coming into our life to accomplish the vision that God has given us. But man, you gotta know what your battles are and there is stuff that comes to me I instantly know, yep, this is who I'm called to be, that's what I'm called to do. And there's also tons of stuff that comes to me and go, no, no, that's, that's not what I wanna do. Like I get invited a whole lot to do debates. And I get a lot of people say, hey man, will you come here and will you debate so-and-so, so-and-so? Usually doctor so-and-so, so-and-so. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I'll meet y'all at the barbecue eating contest. We can go to the rattlesnake roundup, we can do that. But I'm not gonna sit on a stage and debate a bunch of 50 pound heads. Because all I got for you is Jesus and I've also got you're gonna make me mad and that's it. I do not have an intelligent retort. I know what I got grace for and I know what I don't have grace for. And I'm like, mm, no, no, no. Well, what are you scared of? I'm like, I'm scared you're smarter than me. Well, what kind of a man are you? I'm a man that has the gift of real. And just because you're smart doesn't mean that you're not worthless.
I appreciate how smart you are and how many, wrink how many wrinkles you have in your frontal lobe. It's very impressive, but your life is worthless. The impact you make is worthless and I'm busy, bye. Okay, I'm not gonna enter onto that battlefield. I told you, I've either got Jesus or you've made me mad. That's all I've got. So I just don't need to do that. That's just not, that's just not what I'm called to do. But guys, we are called to be the body of Jesus. And in this day where it is so real and it is so apparent that hostility, chaos, fear, and disillusionment has entered into the worldwide landscape, it is also so clear and evident that the church drinks the same Kool-Aid that the world drinks. And out of everything that I've seen, out of everything that, out of everything that I've witnessed, out of everything that, that I've seen happen this year, there's lots of things that surprise me in a sense of, oh wow, okay, wow, just like you, just like all of us. But the one thing that I've actually shook my head out in wonder is how quickly the majority of the body of Jesus will fold as soon as the world demands you fold. And I really didn't think it was that way. I suspected it might be that way, but I really didn't believe it. I was just like, no, I just think a whole lot better of most church leadership, but oh my gosh. Friends, you know, I, I get asked all over the place, everywhere I go, hey, are you guys having church services? I'm like, yeah, well, are y'all safe? And I'm like, you never asked me that when I was in a leprosy village. You never asked me that when I went into a brothel to save little girls. You never asked me that when we were dealing with the cartel in Mexico. You never asked me that in trash dumps throughout the world. You never asked me that in all the stuff that we've done all over the world. You've never, you've, you've never considered it should be a priority for us to be safe until your priority to shut down our church gave an opportunity. And like, uh-uh, I'm not trying to be safe. I'm trying to be effective. I'm not trying to be comfort. I'm trying to be the body of Jesus. I'm trying to make a difference. I'm trying to show the world something different. And I can't do that if I'm worried about comfort and safety. I can't do that. If I'm freaked out over comfort and safety, and if those are my highest priorities, then how can I have the high, then how can I have a higher priority of achieving kingdom vision if I'm worried about everybody's comfort and safety? I have never one time ever taken a group of people into Mexico that I thought it was safe. Like, really? Well, I wouldn't have gone if I'd known that. Why do you think I was in a bulletproof vehicle. <laughs> like, what, what are you talking about? Like, really and truly, I didn't take, I did, I have, we haven't taken thousands of people into Matamoros, Mexico, because it was, because we could guarantee it was safe. We took them in there because we could guarantee Jesus was in there. And that's a much higher priority. I guaranteed that they would make a difference. I guaranteed that they would have their heart broken. I guaranteed that they would see God, but I never guaranteed it was gonna be safe. And I'm not gonna guarantee anybody, anytime, anywhere, that everything's gonna be safe. You live in the world. And you're responsible for pulling up your big boy pants and dealing with the world that you live in. There, all this comes with a price and it has to do with courage. And friends, I wanna tell you, we have to have courage today. We have to have a unified front of courage within the body of Jesus. Not a unified front of we have bowed to the narrative of socialists that we have to promise and guarantee that everything is safe and that we're gonna reach the world in a hazmat suit with gloves on our hands and a mask on our face. That's not what I'm gonna promise anybody. I'm not gonna do that. I wanna just tell you, we have to have courage and what we have to demonstrate across is yes, if we have to comply in some way, somehow or whatever, we can deal with compliances, we can. You know, our own city has been very good to us. Our county has been amazing to us. I thank God for the leadership in our county and I praise God for our leadership in the great free state of Texas. Praise God for that. But friends, we have to have courage. We have to have courage. We haven't faced great, great hostility. We have not. But our friends in California have. Our friends in New York have. 
Our friends in other countries, in, in other states like Michigan, they have, and they have dealt with unbelievable hell that you cannot believe. And here's what I want to say this to even though that we're living in a time in the, in the great free state of Texas where it is completely legal for us to live according to the Constitution and according to the Bill of Rights, imagine me saying that. In some states, it's legal to live according to the Constitution and according to the Bill of Rights, and in other states, it's not legal to live according to the Constitution and to the Bill of Rights. Well, in the state of Texas, it's still legal for us to live according to the Constitution and to the Bill of Rights. And I say this to you, that yes, we have a constitutional right, we have a Bill of Rights, that the third article of the Bill of Rights, let me just show you what the third article of the Bill of Rights actually says. Let me get down here to this. I appreciate our guys messing with me as I jump all over the place. Look at this. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble. Okay, that is the highest law in the land. And it's in plain black and white. Yet, in many states, where leftists and liberals and socialists and humanists are running those, they have no respect. They have no respect for the church. They have no fear of God. And I, and I want to just tell you, they're having to make, there are churches that are having to make choices. Do we risk jail time and still worship Jesus? And, and I want to tell you, some of them are doing it. Some of them are doing it, man. Now, I want, I want to just tell you, it's just like in uh, North Valley Baptist Church. If you don't know the, the, the cause of North Valley Baptist Church, I encourage you guys, on your own time, look up North Valley Baptist Church and look at their videos and look at the hell that they've gone to. They have received over $52,000 in fines for singing. Because you're not allowed to sing, you're not allowed to worship in California, you're not, it's illegal to worship. Because you're not gonna be safe, you're gonna spread a disease to somebody else. Okay, I wanna just tell you, if the world is willing to go along with that, the church should not go along with that. And we should stand with them. And we should bless them and we should encourage them. We should say, we see you and we stand with you. The same as we do our Christian friends in North Korea. The same that we do with our Christian friends in Iran or in communist Cuba or in China, that we stand with them. But while I say that, I can also tell you that at the same exact time that there are people that are making stands in these other places, well, Pastor Troy, we're not real sure if it's real safe. I'm real sure that I don't care. I have never, ever, ever had a priority for being the safest guy in the world. Like, well, then you don't care about how I feel? Let me say this, I wanna say this. I do not care how you feel. I do not care. I have never consulted any limp-wristed leader's opinion on should we save slaves or should we not save slaves? Because you obviously believe it might not be safe. We might get in trouble. Somebody might get mad. We might actually get hate mail. They're slaves. You lay down your life. You do whatever you can do. You spend the money. You know, two years ago, we spent over $800,000 as a church buying human beings throughout the world. Did we have the money to do that? No. Then how did you do it? We just got engaged and said, well, we don't have a budget to do this, but we're just going to have to do it. Well, how'd you do it before that? We mortgaged our homes and it wasn't safe. It wasn't safe for my family for me to mortgage my home seven times. It was not safe. My children could have been homeless. My wife could have been homeless. And we didn't know who was gonna help us. I don't have a big family that would back me up and would take me in. That's not how I live, that's not what I have. I didn't know what we were gonna do if we lost our home. And it was scary. But Jesus says, I send you out as lambs among wolves. And the idea that we're supposed to have a priority of comfort and safety over the kingdom is ludicrous and it's an evil argument. It's evil. 
It, we need, you need to call it evil. If somebody says to you, be safe, be safe, be safe, you need to say, be free and be courageous. Be free, be free, be free. Be courageous, do something, get up. Do something with your life. Don't just sit there because they tell you to sit there. You need to know what your battle is and fight your battle and don't give it up because someone might not be very happy with you being the body of King Jesus. Are you kidding me? You would consider that? Well, there's many friends that we have in California that are just like, man, I no, I'm, I'm gonna take on hell with a water pistol. And this is not the fight that I wanted, but this is who God has called our church to be and we're gonna be the church that Jesus has called us to be. They're not gonna like it. They're gonna call us irresponsible. They're gonna tell us we're a part of the problem. Yeah, that's, that's what the Nazis did. That's exactly what they did. That's what they always do over and over and over again. And guys, I wanna just tell you this, while those churches in blue states are locked down and they cannot worship Jesus, but they still are, and they're facing fines like $5,000 or $10,000 per pastor in their church. So if you got 10 pastors in your church, that's a hundred grand fine. That's what you get for daring to be the church and not minding us. We don't want you to do church anymore. And like, okay, okay. If that's the way that it is, and if that's what's gonna happen, they're, they're, they're up for the fight. They didn't ask for the fight, but they're up for the fight. Now, meanwhile, limp-wristed leaders and Christians of lazy faith try to appease haters in states like Texas where it's completely legal and completely, there's no reason for us not to have church. No reason whatsoever. But to say, we have to try and get along with our haters and we don't have enough leadership to overcome issues. As if that's acceptable. That should not be acceptable to anybody. That should not be okay. Like really, you're just gonna quit being the body of Jesus for a year? Yeah, but look at how many clicks we got and look at how much money came in. Really? That's how you judge the effectiveness of the legacy you leave is how many clicks you get and how much money came to you? King Jesus, friends, we need to repent. We need to be able to point to crowds of people of lives that are transformed. People who are addicted and they're no longer addicted. People who, are people who live devastated lives and no longer live a devastated life. What if somebody comes in here that's sick? Let's pray for them and see them healed. Imagine that. You don't go, you don't run off to a cellar, put on a hazmat suit and surround yourself by toilet paper and call that your ministry. But I'm gonna get more clicks, watch, I'm gonna get more clicks. Listen, I have a media ministry and I love media ministry. I, I promise you I do. I thank God for media ministry. And guys, guys, we're picking it up. We're picking it up and we're doing more and more and more media ministry. I am not against media ministry at all. I want you to hear me say this. As a matter of fact, yesterday when I spoke in Houston, we had over 22,000 views just by holding up an iPhone. At 22,000 views yesterday of just holding up an iPhone, didn't have good reception and still had over 22,000 people plug in. And I'm grateful for that. And I, I'm grateful for, for the form of outreach that that is. And guys, we're gonna continue to do that. Okay, we're gonna continue to do that and I love that. But not at the expense of the presence of God among us, not at the expense of taking care of our own congregation. I wanna just tell you this, if you won't take care of your own congregation, don't tell me you're willing to take care of people on the street. If you won't take care of your own congregation and if you won't take care of your own people, do not tell me you're gonna have a heart for people in Uganda. You don't care about your own house. Well, actually we do, but don't you know that there's a sickness out there? Dude, we have leprosy colonies. I have seen sickness that you cannot possibly imagine and I have spent months and months of my life in leprosy villages and I never wore a mask one single time. I have spent so much time among, um, among our leprous friends in India that every time my foot goes, goes numb, I go, uh-oh. It's true. I go, God, money, my foot. God, I hope I don't have leprosy. Stomp that out. I've been doing that for 20 years. Man, listen, we have, Leanna and I, you have to depend, you have to be the church of God. 
You have to be willing to accept the battlefields that God has called you on. And if not, you will end up on a battlefield. You will have your hat handed to you. Friends, I, everybody's so worried about peace and comfort and safety. Well, we got to have peace with everybody. We can't make anybody mad. If your priority is not to make anybody mad, you cannot follow King Jesus. Well, we got to be comfortable. We got to be comfortable. Guys, I, look, the church is not called to be a cruise ship. The church is called to be a battleship, and it's not comfortable. The Holy Spirit is your comfort. That's your comfort. And guys, listen, if you want the fire of the Holy Spirit to fall upon you, fire falls upon sacrifice, not upon how safe you are. Everybody's worried about safety. I want to show you what First, what first Thessalonians 5, 3 says, and this is a word to the body of Jesus. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction falls upon them. Now, Jesus is talking about the Laodicean church. He's talking about the last church right before he comes back, what the setting of the church is going to be like. And that's why he says, when it says, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. Now, I'm telling you, it's about the majority of the body of Jesus missing the rapture, but you don't want to hear that message because everybody's convinced that if they're saved, they're going to, they're, they're going to be in the rapture. And I'm just telling you this right now. You, you have to be looking for the rapture and you have to be set aside as one of the five believing brides and not, not the five foolish brides. You're going to have to be set aside because not everybody is looking as we are commanded to look and to be ready for the imminent and the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most people have no hope in the Lord whatsoever. They're just looking for advanced skill sets. Okay, then you better be looking for King Jesus. Now, whenever it's talking about a pregnant woman, it's always talking about the rapture of the church. It's always talking about the return of the Lord Jesus. Here's what I want to show you. There's two different churches that I want to focus on in the book of Revelation. And one is Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And it's actually known as the lukewarm church. It says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, these things says the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Stop. Guys, the book of Revelation is a book of prophetic timelines. Not only is, you just need to know that because it's prophetic, there's tons and tons of timelines hidden within the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter six, when it gives the four horsemen, that's actually also how a prophetic timeline works, right? The white horse shows up. And then comes the red horse, and then comes the dark horse, and then comes the colorless horse, okay? And you have to know how those seasons work. It's four, and it represents four spiritual seasons that happen within a cycle. There's, there's all kinds of these, but one of them is actually when Jesus addresses the seven churches in Revelation, in Revelation chapter two and Revelation chapter three, there are seven churches that represent seven church ages. Now, these were actual seven churches and they were in a region that is modern day Turkey now. And they were there and they called that Asia at the time. And they were there and he was addressing them, but it's also a prophetic timeline. And the last one of those, the very last one of those is Laodicea. And it's interesting because in the book, in, in the, whenever Jesus addresses the church of Laodicea, he's actually on the outside trying to get back in, knocking on the door. And what he's saying is right before I come back, this church, this church will not be passionate about the things of the kingdom. They'll be so wrapped up in the things of the world, they think they're doing great because they're doing great by worldly standards and they're not doing great by kingdom standards. And they won't know the difference. And Jesus is describing the actual condition of the majority of the body of Jesus at his imminent return. So let's see if this fits into our day and let's talk about this. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness. He's like, you, you don't know the truth and I'm gonna introduce truth to you because you've been deceived. And that was one of the key things that Jesus told the disciples concerning the last days right before Jesus came back as he said this, you don't wanna be deceived in that day. Okay, he says, I know your what guys? Your works. Any church that is not producing works that look like Jesus is gonna be judged by Jesus himself. But Pastor Troy, we got up and we preached on churches throughout the Bible that produce works. Wasn't that good enough? No, Jesus knows you by your works. 
The fifth book of the New Testament is not called the philosophies of the saints. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. He says, I'm looking at what you're doing. I'm looking at what you're producing. I'm looking at what you're motivated to do. I'm looking at your passion to actually do something. And I'm judging you, not according to how I saved you. I'm judging you now that you are saved according to how you act like you're saved. So he says, I know you by your works. And he says that you are neither cold nor hot. You're just not passionate about anything kingdom. I would wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. When Jesus says to the last church age, he's speaking into a lot of what he's seeing in the American church right now. And God Almighty gently says, you make me want to throw up. I want to just say, as, as a church leader, this is scary to me. And I have looked at this verse over and over and over. I never want the Lord to look at what we do as a church and say, Troy, that just makes me sick. Hadn't you ever seen anything in the body of Jesus that just makes you sick? You just go, oh man. I wanna just tell you, when I see churches that have shut down for a whole year of their life and just say, we're just gonna quit being the church for a year. Don't worry, we'll get lots of clicks. Keep on sending, your, keep on sending in your money. And that's how we'll judge if we're successful or not. When I see that, it makes me wanna throw up. It makes me sick. And like, we need you. We need you. Please stand up. Please be the church. Please. Please figure it out. Please accept the challenges of the day that we live in. Because here's what's real. If you will not stand up for Jesus when it is legal, what do you think you're going to do when it ain't legal? Clearly, you will be out to lunch. Clearly. Then he says this, so then because you're, luke, because, because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I don't need anything. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to pay the price and to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you might be rich and white garments that you might be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness might not be revealed. Encourage you to anoint your eyes with the eye that you might be able to see. And as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. He's talking to church, says, listen, I love you, but I'm not going to let this slide. You say everything's good. I got tons of money. It's all good. Everything's fine, man. Look at all this money I got. Look at all this money. You don't have a clue of how poor you actually are. Oh, you got money, but you don't have the kingdom. You got the world's approval. You got lots of clicks to approve it. You got, you, look, I can prove I have the world's approval. Look at how many clicks I got. That is ludicrous and ridiculous. Jesus judges the church according to works and fruit. <laughs> works and fruit. He doesn't show up and see, say, I see that thou hast not worketh in a year for fear. How pleased I ameth. That's not what he does, dude. And if you're not, listen, honestly, I, I, I get lots of hate mail. I'm sick and tired of you calling me a coward. Well, quit being a coward. Do something. You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what I'm doing. I know what you're not doing. You're not doing church and you are the church. Be the church. I don't care how you do it. I don't care if you meet on Saturdays or Sundays. I don't care if you do five hour services or five minute services. Let God Almighty be seen in the midst of your congregation and do something. And if you're too scared to open up the doors in an air conditioned building with a screen and with a microphone to have church, I guarantee you, you're not saving girls out of sexual trafficking. I guarantee you, you are not feeding the poor. I guarantee you, you are not being in the midst of all the mess today. You can't tell me, no, no, we're involved in those really dangerous things, but it's too scary for us to have a church service. I want to show you the church of Philadelphia. And unto the angel in the church of Philadelphia write these things, says he who is holy and he who is true. He who has the key of David who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. I want to just tell you this. He's not saying they have their act together. He says, well... You haven't bailed and you kept my name. 
And he's like, I'm impressed. There's probably 10 million things that the church of Philadelphia did wrong. And see, this is one of the issues today is, okay, what if we start having church and what if we do something wrong? Dude, get up and do something, even if it is wrong. Give Jesus something to work with. Do something. Get up and do something. Be the body of Jesus. Open your doors, churches. Open your doors. So then he says this. He says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews or not, but they lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet to know that I have loved you. He's like, look, I'm going to put my hand upon you and all your enemies who have been hostile against you who say they're the ones walking with God. What's real is I'm going to let them know you better not mess with my boys. That's what he's saying. Because you kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. That's called the great tribulation. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no man takes your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out. That's the promise of supernatural stability in the presence of God. And I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven. And I'll write on him my new name. He who is near, let him hear what the spirit says, churches. He's got, he goes, I got three new identities to give you. That's going to blow your mind. Now, friends, it's time for me to close. But I just want to just say this. I, I, I know that when I get up and when I speak like this, I'm going to be accused of being hateful. I'm going to be accused of being, I want to be encouraging and say this. I want to say this to you. And I want to say this to every single person that is in the body of Jesus. This is a shining time for us. This is not a time for us to take off and just go to the beach. And say, well, we're just going to let the world, you know, Hollywood will step up and they'll fix everything for us. They're so good. They're so good. And, and, and the United Nations, they got a bunch of brainiacs among them, man. They'll figure out how to make the world work, man. They, oh, hey, I know what let's do. Let's leave it over to our politicians. And let's let those brilliant people figure everything out because they love us so much and they stay up all night long worried about us. If the body of Jesus does not step up, there's nobody else coming. And I want to encourage you and tell you to quit being afraid of the day that you live in. I know that there's challenges and I know things have changed and everybody hates challenges and everybody hates change. So what? It falls upon us to fight for our first and our second amendment rights. It falls upon us to declare freedom. It falls upon us to point at injustice and say that has to be changed. It falls upon us to stand up and say, excuse me, this is insane and we're here to bring supernatural sanity. It falls upon us to be the body of Jesus, to know the truth, to stand with the truth and to not be swept away by a lie. How can we leave a legacy if we're not gonna be the body of Jesus? How can we be, how can we possibly be the body of Jesus and leave a legacy if we take off a year or two until the world figures out when it's safe for us to gather? (laughs) I'm amazed that it would seem sane for any church leadership to sit around and just go, let's just take off for a year or two. It's, it's demonic insanity. And just tell you this, as for you and me, we ain't going nowhere. As a matter of fact, we're stepping up and we're gonna be light in the midst of the darkness and we're gonna be a voice in the midst of silence. We're gonna be a smile while everybody's faces are covered. We're going to be the hands and feet of King Jesus while everybody else is wearing gloves and a daggum hazmat suit. We're going to see the fire of God. We're going to see the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to have testimonies that are so awesome, people will look at us and say, I don't think that that's true. I got a testimony. There was a child in this church three months ago that was found at the bottom of a swimming pool, and an hour after he was dead, he became alive again. I have that testimony. That's in this church. Like, I tell you what, how in the world can you believe that Jesus raises people from the dead if you can't even believe that you can get gathered together without everybody in the room dying? 
Hey, listen, we've been open all year. There was a, a six or eight week period where we were shut down by the state. So we just moved everything to the parking lot. And when our parking lot was not big enough, we went to other, we went to the hospital parking lot. And we got together and are you ready for this? We've been fully open since Mother's Day, all three services, and we have not died. It's a lie. So stand up, everybody stand up. And stand up church, be the body of Jesus. Be the body of Jesus. Lord God, let there be a special grace on your body to come out of the Laodicean church and to be a part of the Philadelphia church. Lord God Almighty, I pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that there would be a revival, actually a revolution in the body of Jesus that says, we can't go back to doing church like what we used to do it. We have to be the church now. We have to. And not only, not only were we not willing to do anything outside of the four walls of the church, then we moved into the stage we weren't even willing to do anything inside the walls of the church. And I pray, Father God, sir, that there would be a great revival and a revolution in the body of King Jesus that causes us, God, not to be lukewarm, but God, to be fired up and passionate, completely cold to the hostility of the world and unmoved, and completely on fire for the passion of Jesus towards people of every race, of every age, of every demographic, of every background, of every, every place. And we say, you belong in the kingdom. Jesus has a destiny for you. Father, I pray, God, let that be. And I love you and praise you and thank you, Lord God Almighty, sir, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Guys, our altar team is up here. If you need prayer, let us pray for you. We believe in signs, miracles, and wonders. Amen. If you're a first-time visitor, come on, man. I want to meet you right over here. i got a book I want to give you. And for all my friends that are watching live online, I love you. I call you all the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and highly favor of the Lord. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you all again for tuning in here at Open Door Church in Burleson, Texas. We hope that this message blessed you. We hope that you shared this message to others so that we can spread courage and not fear and leave a lasting legacy. Wow. I thought I liked last sermon series, but this sermon series is blowing my mind already. We hope that you will continue to join us for this teaching series, Lasting Legacy, as we celebrate 25 years of being the body of Christ and being who God has called us to be. You know what? We are here. We are doing it. And it's all because of you. It's all because we are gathering together and we are being the body of Christ. So thank you guys for not being afraid. Thank you for tuning in. And thank you for joining us as we take on hell with a water pistol, pistol as Pastor Troy likes to say. All right, you guys, we will see you next Next time, until then, we call you the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and highly favored of the Lord. Bye, you guys.